Welcome back to the Market Insights webinar. It's Kevin Prince here from BMO ETFs. Thank you for joining us one more time for our weekly insights where we want to give you some thoughts around the old market. Now, I'm really pleased about today's show because we're going to talk about tax loss harvesting. Very insightful, got a great lineup for you. Before we do that, let's get into uh, some of the disclaimers and that stuff. What I'm saying here, disclaimers, and if you've been to the show before, what you know is we're not giving specific advice. We're not giving specific recommendations. What we really want to do is just provide you overall insights and education around the market. Now, one more time, same thing. We have our guests here from uh, Investor Line. They're going to join us. Of course, I use their disclaimer too. So with that, let's get into the topic because this is something we certainly had a lot of questions come in. And again, those people out there that send us questions on a weekly basis, thank you. You really do help guide our uh, content. And please, for those out there who are thinking about sending us questions, is it, questions in, please do that. So from an introduction perspective, let me introduce John Waters. He comes from BMO Wealth Management, leads up the tax aspects and consultation around that for BMO Wealth Management. Alfred Lee comes from BMO Asset Management, and he is an investment strategist as well as an ETF portfolio manager. manager. And Jay Lactuella comes from BMO Investor Line. So thanks very much, panel. Appreciate you joining us this week and sharing your insights. Now, Jay, normally we start off with a tool and, and walk people through something interesting out there. You have something different to share with us this week. You certainly have uh, three ways to invest at Investor Line, but you also have a special offer you want to share with the audience too. Let me hand this off to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin. I appreciate it. Yeah, let me start by giving everyone a highlight on the three different ways we have to invest online. On the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see our award-winning self-correct platform. This is for the type of investor that prefers to do their own research and make their own investment decisions. On the right-hand side is BMO Smartfolio. If you're the type of investor that prefers to have professionals manage your portfolio, this is the right platform for you. We do it through BMO ETFs, and of course, you can have access to your account anywhere, anytime online. What I'm most excited to share with everyone today is talk about our Advice Direct platform that's very unique to BMO and BMO Investor Line. This is for the type of investor that prefers to have unbiased, personalized investment advice backed by sound fundamental research to help guide their investment decisions. And I'll be using a couple of stocks and an ETF later in the presentation to really highlight the power of this platform because it's really phenomenal. Uh, but I wanted to also share with everyone a promotion we have in the market. If you go to the next slide, Kevin. For those of you on the webinar here today that open up and fund a new Advice Direct account, you could get up to $2,500 in cash back, a very, very rich promotion. All you have to do is use the digital code or the promotion code DIGITAL12. When you open up your new account, this promotion ends on January 5th. I'd encourage you to look for more details in the follow-up email. And of course, go online and do some research into this too. It's a very rich promotion in the market right now. But that, I'll turn it back to you, Kevin. Thanks, Jay. And I look forward to seeing your examples in a little bit, how the power of the tool can be leveraged. With that, let's get into the core topic for today. Again, it's tax loss harvesting. Now, it's a unique concept out there, maybe a longer, longer thought process around it, but it's certainly something to consider as we move into the year end. Now, I, maybe I can reach out to John. Walk us through when we talk about what is tax loss harvesting, please. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Uh, tax loss harvesting is a common year end tax planning strategy. And, and essentially, you would look at your investment portfolio year to date and tally up any realized capital gains or losses in all of your taxable non-registered accounts. And to the extent you've got an overall net capital gain, you would consider triggering some capital losses to offset those gains and reduce your current year tax liability. Uh, now, however, we, we always recommend that the investment mandate should guide your decisions. So ideally you'd look for some securities with accrued losses that had otherwise you had otherwise intended to sell in the short term. However, even if security is down, <clears throat> we often like to look at the long, we often like the long-term prognosis on that security. So we may be tempted to sell at a loss now and repurchase immediately so we don't miss out on the upside. However, the tax rules require an economic change. So the rules would prohibit a sale at a loss if you immediately reacquire that same security or within 30 days after the loss sale 
and you still hold that security uh, 30 days following that loss sale, the so-called superficial loss rules. Therefore, to avoid this rule, what we would consider doing is reinvesting the proceeds from the sale of that lost security immediately, but in a different security uh, that has a high correlation to the one that was disposed of to maintain that market exposure and avoid sitting on the sidelines for 30 days, since obviously a lot can happen, particularly in volatile markets. So ETFs are often very effective tools for this tax loss selling strategy since they can help you maintain a similar market exposure without a single stock risk and, and or avoiding the superficial loss rule that I just mentioned. Thanks for that, John. And you covered a bit of this here example there, but let me just simply say, maybe give you a high level, why tax loss harvest? Like what's in it for doing this at this time of the year? Well, the main reason, Kevin, is is the, the tax savings, because if you have a capital gain and uh, you would obviously pay tax on that when you file your tax return. So the idea of, of doing the tax loss harvesting is to get the capital loss to offset that to reduce your tax bill. But we have to recognize, as I mentioned, the importance of the investment mandate and not letting the tax tail wave the investment dog, as, as accountants like to say. But an ETF strategy can allow you to re-enter the market immediately after that lost sale to mitigate the impact to your investment mandate. Yeah, I like that thought because you have conviction in that, let's see, sector, market, whatever it is. You're just keeping a chip on the table while you're invoking the tax loss harvesting thought process or strategy yeah. to board. You know what? Do me a favor. Can you walk us through an example too? I know you did one up for us, sir. I'll bring it up on the screen here. Yeah, for sure. So let's say we've got a couple securities here and let's say I can jump to point number two here that we had earlier this year sold XYZ stock when it was trading at a 20% gain. So let's say we purchased it at $100 and we sold it at 120. We had a capital gain of $20 that was realized. And then sort of getting towards the end of the year, we look at our stock portfolio and say, you know what, stock ABC is, is down a bit. I could trigger a capital loss on that. So let's say I purchased that at 100, it's now trading at 80. I sell it, get a $20 capital loss. The net uh, capital gains is zero because I've got a $20 gain offset by this $20 loss, assuming that that's uh, all of the sales within your portfolio from an aggregate basis overall. You've eliminated that capital gain that you would have otherwise paid tax on and um, have eliminated uh, any, any, any tax on that gain for that matter. So the idea here is that um, you might still want to get back into the market. We can't go into that exact same security for the reasons I mentioned around the superficial loss rule. So you might look at other securities out there that might mimic that exposure on the um, XY, or sorry, the ABC stock that you sold. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I also like the fact you, in the example you flatten it out, it doesn't always work that way, but yeah, the general idea is there too, try to mitigate the taxes by utilizing those losses to offset those gains and keeping that, uh, as I say, chip on the table for that exposure you're looking for. You know, of course, there's some other considerations. Maybe you can share some of those key things with us too, John. Yeah, always more considerations in the tax world, Kev. So the first thing that I would mention here is that you may not have some capital gains in the current year to offset, but you could still do this strategy. So the idea here is that you would create an overall net capital loss from all the sales that you undertook in 2020 and carry back that net capital loss to apply against capital gains that you reported in 2017, 18 or 19 to recover any tax that you previously paid on those capital gains that you reported in those years. But of course, again, we have to be aware of the superficial loss rule that says if you dispose of uh, a security, you cannot repurchase that security or an identical security or an option for that matter to acquire that security uh, within the period that is 30 days before and after that lost sale, if you still maintain that security at the end of the 30 days following the, the lost sale. I would also mention that um, you know, CRA is sort of uh, one step ahead of you here and says that you can't repurchase the same security in your registered account. So you sell it in your non-registered account, you generate a capital loss, you can't buy it back in your TFSA in that 30-day period or your RSP or RIF, 
or for that matter, your spouse can't buy it or a common law partner can't buy it back in their account uh, or registered account, or for that matter, a corporation that you or your spouse or common law partner controls. So they sort of one step ahead of you on, on some of the ideas that often get bandied about. And the final thing that I would mention here is that um, we want to, if we're triggering some capital losses, we want those to take effect in the 2020 tax year to, to offset those gains that we have. Uh, so the important thing is we need that trade to settle in, in 2020. So usually with a two-day settlement period, that uh, gives us right up until December 29th so that it will settle by the end of this year. That's very insightful and it's good to know the actual last date implemented because it gives some people time to think through the strategy itself. And of course, I got to say, what does our compliance department always says to us? Or make sure you remind everybody to talk to their tax advisor before implementing a tax loss harvesting strategy. So think about that too, beyond the 29th, uh, for the dates you have, we just gave you. With that, let me bring Alfred into the conversation because Alfred, let's talk about why ETFs are you know, effective as a tax loss harvesting tool. Yeah, for sure. So John already alluded to, you know, ETFs being a great investment vehicle for uh, tax loss harvesting. But, you know, the reason why is because, you know, when you look at the ETF market, I think a lot of people, they think about ETFs as being these uh, investment vehicles that provide exposure to, you know, very broad markets like the S&P 500, the TSX, which is absolutely true. Um, but the ETF industry has evolved, um, you know, a lot in the last decade where you could get specific exposures as well. So if you get wants to get exposure to, let's say, you know, the REIT sector or the energy sector, or if you even want to get exposure to the PREF market or um, gold bullion, uh, you could do that through an ETF. So in my opinion, I think, you know, an ETF essentially is an access vehicle that allows investors to target virtually every corner of the market. Uh, in addition to that, uh, ETFs are very low cost. You could get exposure to, you know, the S&P 500 for, you know, five to six basis points. Uh, when you compare that to, you know, traditional uh, funds, it's definitely a lot more cost efficient. And, um, you know, ETFs are diversified investment vehicles where it's essentially a basket of uh, securities. So you do minimize that uh, company specific risk. And transparency is also key. I think, um, as we all know, after the 2008 crisis, it, it's very important to know exactly what you own in your portfolio. And with an ETF, uh, with an ETF on the ETF provider site, they will list uh, every single holding within that ETF down to the very last holding on a daily basis. Uh, so you know exactly what you're getting. So from a tax uh, harvesting uh, point of view, uh, you know exactly what that basket holds and you know exactly you know what kind of exposure you're exactly targeting. So it's very important, I think, uh, in terms of transparency. And last but not least, uh, there's no intraday holding period. So you can uh, buy and sell an ETF on the same day. Uh, which I think on an in, from a tax loss harvesting perspective, um, you know, having that liquidity is very important. Alfred, I mean, thank you, because you, you do a ton of strategy around this area too, and certainly been sharing it with a, a number of key stakeholders out there. Maybe do me a favor and walk us through maybe a Canadian, some examples, and as well as some U.S. examples of, you know, where somebody can look at implementing a strategy and, and walk them through the, the details of that. And this is a little bit dated, sure. September 30 data, September 30th data, but still key concept there. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, John walked through, uh, did a very good job walking through, um, you know, the example using the um, uh, ABC and XYZ stock as an example. But why don't we apply these to some of the losses that we saw both in the Canadian and the U.S. market uh, this year? Um, so take, for example, Air Canada, as we all know, uh, got hit pretty bad in, in the wake of the uh, coronavirus. Um, so that uh, that security was down 67% uh, year to date. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind is that we are using year to date as an example here. Uh, for tax loss selling, uh, you're supposed to compare your book value uh, to the compare to the uh, current traded price. Uh, but because we don't know where you bought your security, uh, what we did was we used this. We used the year to date uh, game loss as uh, just a reference point. So Air Canada. Um, as I mentioned, is down 70%. Uh, if you wanted to sell that security, you can uh, reinvest in the BMO Equal Aid Industrials uh, ETF, ZIN, or the iShares S&P Global Industrials ETF, both of which have exposure to the airlines, 
Uh, so it gets you a good proxy to uh, airline stocks such as Air Canada. Uh, energy stocks, as we all know, have taken it on the chin as well. Uh, Synovus and Suncor, both down in the tune of about 60%. Uh, so if you want to sell those securities, what you could do is you could reinvest it into uh, the BMO Equal Weight Oil and Gas Index ETF and also the iShares uh, S&P TSX Capped Energy ETF as well, uh, which is XEG. Um, a couple ones that weren't listed on this uh, on this table are the banks. Uh, banks have come back a little bit in the last two weeks, uh, but a good example is, for example, uh, Bank of Nova Scotia. That is down uh, 15% year to date, uh, so that would be a good candidate for tax law selling as well. If you want to reinvest it into uh, ZEB or RBNK, which is the BMO and RBC respectively, uh, bank ETFs, uh, those are a good way to get exposure to those uh, particular sectors. Uh, on the U.S. side, a lot of uh, a lot of potential tax loss candidates as well. Even though we have seen the S&P 500 bounce back, it hasn't been a uniform uh, recovery. Certain sectors have been hit, still have uh, lagged the market overall. Um, so good examples would be uh, the banking sector. The banking sector has uh, clearly lagged the market uh, in the recovery over the last five to six months. Uh, so good examples would be um, uh, Wells Fargo, Citibank, uh, Bank of America, all of which are down um, notably this year. So if you want to sell those and reinvest in the uh, BMO Equate U.S. Bank ETF or the RBC U.S. Bank ETF, ZBK and R RUBH respectively, uh, those would be good strategies in terms of, you know, staying exposed to the sector so you don't miss out on any opportunity uh, opportunity costs. Thanks, Albert. I think you're right. I mean, what you're really trying to say is, you know, here's some alternatives to holding again that keep keep that chip on the table, but effectively come back to it in the future if you like that position. Now, I'm going to bring Jay into this because, you know, Alfred, you've got a lot of experience. You know that you've got conviction to stay in that security, the whole works. There are people out there, I mean, how, how have the same kind of ability to provide conviction to say, do I want to come back to that security? Jay, talk to us a little bit about how Advice Direct might be a supporting tool for somebody in their decision-making process. Absolutely, Kevin, thank you. Uh, let's go to the example, and I have to say, folks, before I dive into this example, um, this is only for illustration and educational purposes, right? In no way am I giving you any advice over here. Uh, I use the bank. I don't know if you caught this on Alfred's previous slide. This is Trust Financial Corp, uh, ticker symbol TFC. It was down about 30% um, as of September. Of course, we know since then, after the US elections and after the two successful vaccine trials, uh, the markets have moved up. But again, for the sake of uh, tax loss harvesting, if we go with it being down 30%, you now need that conviction. You need that validation. After 31 days, should I be going back into this particular stock? Well, enter Advice Direct. At a few clicks of a mouse, really, you type in the ticker symbol, hit research, you can pull up this report. And I know it's a busy slide, so let me help break it down for you. On the top right-hand side, you will see a buy recommendation with 62.3. Really, that's a scale of zero to 100. Anything over 60, we recommend you buy that stock. Crest Financial gets a grade of 62.3. How do we come up with that grade? If you look at the first half of this slide with that circle, it's divided into four quadrants. And really what we're doing here is looking at the fundamental data of this company. If you look in the first half of the quadrant, the valuation side of things, the more blue you see there, folks, the better the company is doing in those metrics. Those metrics are things like dividend yield, price to earnings ratios, et cetera. It gets a grade of A. So we're saying, from a valuation perspective, there's still value in the stock. If you go below that and you look at cash flow, it gets an A minus. Decent cash flow for this regional bank out of North Carolina. And then there's other metrics like growth and profitability as well. So if you're an individual investor and you don't have the experience or expertise like Alfred, you are taking a, a loss on this and you wanna go back into it, you would pull up a report like this and you would have that conviction to say, okay, I'm still gonna be able to buy this stock and the fundamental data supports that. On the second half of the slide, you get a breakdown of the sector and the industry, but I want to, what I want to draw your attention to is a sentiment score. It's that box at the bottom half of the screen that has those letter grades in it. So while we're giving you the fundamental data, we're also providing you with some sentiment and some technical data, things like the trend of the stock, the momentum of that company, 
earnings guidance that management has provided? Are people shorting that stock or not? And all of that will translate into a sentiment grade to help guide your investment decision as well. And at the very bottom, all you're seeing there is a one-year price return of TFC. That's that blue part of the graph. Uh, and that's relative to the benchmark in orange. If you go to the next slide, I used a, a name that more of us would be familiar with, Citigroup. Uh, on the previous slide, Alfred talked about this. This was down 42.5% approximately. So again, as an investor for tax loss strategies, you might say, okay, I'm going to sell Citigroup. How do I know for sure I want to get back into this company? Again, advice direct. You would type in the letter C, hit research, and you would pull up a report like this. And in a few seconds, you will have all of this data uh, available to you. I'm only using two pages of the report. It's actually eight pages long. I don't want to go through all eight pages on this webinar, so I'll stick to the first two pages here. Uh, again, if you look at the fundamental quadrant, we look at a valuation, it gets an A+, plus. cash flow, a B+, plus, and an average grade for growth and profitability. And by the way, folks, one thing I forgot to mention earlier is if you look at the bottom half of that screen, right below that circle, that green, yellow, red that you're seeing, those are email triggers that we would provide you if you held that stock in terms of buy, sell, hold recommendations. And with Citigroup, again, if I look at the second half of this report, um, from a sentiment perspective, it gets an F for price trend and a failing grade for momentum, average grade for earnings guidance, let's say, and, that, and an A plus for short interest. And so again, you can see one year returns still down in that negative 40% versus the benchmark that has since recovered. Um, so again, you know, we, I used two stocks over here, but Alfred also talked about the ETF strategy. So if we go to the next slide, I have an ETF example. Let's bring it back home to Canada. Let's say you want to go in and you're looking at Canadian banks, or you want to go in and you're looking at Canadian ETFs, or maybe you want to go into broader U.S. ETFs. You would simply choose a category through Advice Direct, and I've used ETFs on the screen. If you look at, a little, if you look at the tab to the right, it says mutual funds. On the tab to the left, it says equities. You could really do this for any of these. So if it was a stock or an ETF, I can put in a sector, I can put in a category, it would give me specific advice based on my individual investor profile. So when you open up an account, we understand who you are, your risk tolerance, your asset allocation, diversification, et cetera, and give you personalized recommendations. So here you would get a list of the best in class ETFs. You can sort by management expense ratios if you're cost sensitive, you can sort by dividend yields if you're looking for a higher yield on there, and you, had a, you would have access to all of this great research through this Advice Direct platform. So with there, I'll end and pass it back to you, Kevin. Well, thanks, uh, Jay, and thanks for you know showing us some ways that tools can be used to help give people confidence, even if implement a strategy like tax loss harvesting. Now, while we're on the topic of taxes, let's talk about something that a little step away from the tax loss harvesting strategy, but just to highlight at this time of the year, through the respective ETF providers out there, pay attention to the announcements are coming out there's generally two announcements that come out one's a distribution estimate for november and these are the estimates of capital gains that the respective etf companies will be passing through to the end investors so for example if there's a rebalance through the year or something like that there might be a triggering a, a gain or so and that's going to be passed through so important to look at that and watch that if you're holding it and you're already up not a bigger thing because of course you got to figure out you already have a gain inside your security, but it is a consideration before you buy something at this time of the year to just to take a look at that because that'd be a distribution of a capital gain come to the year. Now, of course, you'll just adjust your cost base for that. Simple as that. But I also highlight in addition to the November estimates, there'll be more of a final number in December. Now, if you're looking for this, take a look at your respective ETF companies' websites. All this is disclosed on their websites. We just posted ours out this week. And I'd say all the other ETF providers do the exact same thing. And you can even drill down and take a look at the respective inf information from previous years too, just to help you make informed decisions out there for your respective holdings. Anyway, it's a nice little tip. Watch for distributions this, uh, this time of the year, as well as watch them in December. Just another consideration if you're buying an ETF right now, or going back to the point, if you're in a loss, factor that into as part of your decision. With that, let's switch gears. Let's go through some of the key questions that came in today. And I'm gonna kick off one for John. Now, John, here's an interesting example. I know you covered off a few uh, 
you know, loopholes that people try to look at, but moving to the RSP and and uh, selling inside their cash account. What happens if somebody sells the XIC TSX cap composite and buys ZCN the TSX cap composite, both the same index? Can I do that for tax loss selling harvest? Yeah, unfortunately, the answer is no, Kev, but it is a great question, and it's something that comes up a lot from advisors and clients is trying to figure out what constitutes an identical property. So CRA <clears throat> considers two securities to be identical properties if they're the same in all material respects, such that a prospective buyer would be indifferent between purchasing one over the other. So you really would have to look at all the interest rights and privileges of each security and including the legal structure, the asset composition, the risk factors and any restrictions of ownership, uh, things like that to make that determination. Now, fortunately, CRA has provided some guidance in the past regarding mutual funds and, and stated that uh, mutual funds that track the same index, even if they're from uh, com different competitors in the marketplace, would be considered an identical uh, property. So by extension with, with ETFs, in, the, in this case, since they both track the same uh, market index, the expectation is that these would be considered identical properties. So that if you were to uh, sell one and then repurchase the other within that 30 day period and continue to hold it, uh, your loss would be denied as a superficial loss. Uh, and therefore that would uh, sort of render the strategy of the tax loss selling uh, ineffective. But they could do something like a different ETF that's following the broad market, like a ZLB or something like that, and that would be okay, but just not specifically the same index, right? Yeah, if you're on a different index, then there's arguably a significant enough difference between the two securities that an investor would not be indifferent between them, uh, so that that strategy would work. Thanks for that, John. And of course, we're going to stay out. Of, we're going to stay in that position for 31 days and come back to it if somebody wants. Mm -hmm. Alfred, let me bring this to you. Question coming in around growth ETF funds out there from BMO. So uh, we certainly have a broad product line out there. Maybe you can highlight uh, two that maybe more growth focused out there. Sure. So I, I think there's, you know, there's two ways to tackle this question. There's uh, one way of just getting it through um, one asset class. So I would say ZGQ, which is our high quality uh, global ETF. I think that's a good way to get growth uh, into uh, into a product or a single ETF. Uh, ZGrow, if you're looking for more of an asset allocation based ETF, is also another uh, ETF that provides you with uh, essentially an ETF of ETFs that is more growth focused. Thanks for that, Alfred. I'm going to stay with you for a bit because there's got a lot of questions coming in. Now, Alfred, I know you have a lot of rich experience in regards towards real return bonds. When should somebody hold them and when don't you want to hold them, for example? And I mean, the context is here on the ETFs, of course. Yeah, so with the real return bond, um, you know, essentially how it works is that uh, the the base of the, so the notional amount of the bonds will adjust to inflation. So inflation being CPI in this case. Uh, so when inflation goes up, that base of that, uh, that notional amount for that bond will adjust upwards. So that means you're getting more coupon payments as well. Uh, so in an inflationary environment, uh, that is, you know, a, a a time when you want to hold real return bonds uh, and obviously on the flip side if it's a deflationary environment uh, that's generally not uh, a good time to own real return bonds thank you for that still staying with you thanks for the rapid fire here now this person here is holding a concentrated position in regards towards banks and some corporate dividend stocks um, you know what highlight there is next week we're going to spend some time and we're going to dive directly into banks so it's a little shout out to the uh the uh show next week we're going to talk about both canadian and u.s banks and the etfs of course in that space alfred what's your thoughts about this kind of approach of a concentrated holding and how do etfs work with it um you know to go really concentrated, obviously, um, it, it exposes a, an investor to a lot of risk. Um, obviously, the more the more concentrated your strategy becomes, you expose yourself to more, you know, company specific risk. And if you're um, concentrated in a few sectors, like uh, like this investor is asking, it does expose you to sector specific risk as well, right? So, you know, 2008 was a good example during the financial crisis. Even though the Canadian banks came out well ahead uh, and proved to be you know, a lot more sound than their global counterparts. 
um, they still experienced uh, quite quite a sell off in 2008. So that in that case, I think you want to be diversified not only with being in a range of broader stocks, but also having you know other asset classes like bonds and alternative assets in in your portfolio as well. You know, as the old adage goes, uh, never put all your eggs in one basket. I think that is uh, that definitely applies here. Thanks for that, Alfred. And again, tune in next week to hear more about bank stocks. Um, one more question for you here. Be interesting to discuss the benefits and risks of preferred shares, another area you're quite familiar with. Give us some insights around that, please. Yeah, so with preferred shares, I think, you know, the general risk is uh, in, in the past, it's, it's, it's you know, there's credit risk. Uh, so there's the credit worthiness of the issuers. Uh, there's also interest rate risk as well. So the Canadian preferred share market is generally made up of rate resets would make make up uh, 75% of the market. So they tend to be exposed to the direction of interest rates. So if interest rates go up, they, they benefit. And when interest rates go down, they uh, tend to be negatively impacted as well. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, you know, one thing I will note is that certain changes in, in the last couple of months have made the preferred share market a little bit more stable. Uh, but overall, it's, it's the direction of interest rates that investors have to be concerned about. Thanks for that, Alfred. I think I'm going to go. Yeah, I'll do the last question for you. Sorry there. Uh, somebody's dipping their toe into ZPay. And, uh, you know, really, they give us a little bit of background around ZPay itself. But specifically, why is it holding um, U.S. Treasuries when you look underneath the hood? Yeah, so with ZPay, um, you know, this is a strategy where we are, you know, combining covered calls and covered puts. So we're writing call options when we're writing uh, put options as well. Uh, the reason why we own the T-bills is because the T-bills are held essentially as collateral uh, for the put and call options. Um, so we, we did, I believe, do a, a deeper dive on ZPay. I think that uh, video is available on YouTube to, to my knowledge. Yep, it is. So, yeah, if you're looking for more information on ZPay, I encourage you to take a look at the YouTube list. And, of course, if you want to find them on YouTube, just type in BMO Market Insights. There's a whole playlist up there for you. And just take a look at some of the previous uh, shows. We have over 30 of them now available. So take a look. Lots of rich content like this show itself. And that brings us to a close for this week. We're going to be back next week on November 27th, one more time at 1 o'clock. I encourage you to send in your questions to look forward to answering those as well as utilize them in direction for content. And one more time, our content next week will focus in around banks. Thank you again. Have yourself a good weekend.